You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film A Place at the Table about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com on demand backslash a place at the table stem. Through Cotton Tales podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Today, we are talking with Wes Hendricks, an entrepreneur and producer on Blacks Radio and also a QA engineer in the gaming industry. Wes graduated from San Jose State University that gave birth to the first internet streaming radio station and one of the first black websites. As a college student, Wes was exposed to new open source software that permitted live streaming before that form of communication became commonplace. His career began on local radio stations KPIX and KGO Radio. Wes, tell me about your latest adventure. Uh, we have a radio state, a digital radio station. It's called uh, Black Radio, B L A X Radio. You can get it on Live Three Sixty Five, uh, Apple Music. Uh, so if you iPhone or Mac, you can get it on there, or uh, TuneIn, which is also another app. How long have you been doing that? Black Radio, I think it's about two years old. It's, you know, we with my history in radio and everything, we just kind of decided to take a swing at this, this. You know, we've always been active in some form of media, and we've always been fans of radio and everything. So we just, uh, you know, put this down. Okay. All right. Let's double back then. Tell me about Wes. Who is he? Who are his parents and his siblings and that kind of thing? Well, uh, I'm a brother, uh, a father of a 20-year-old, um, son of uh, two wonderful parents who, you know, stuck together over 50 years and uh, showed me the ways of this crazy world and, you know, helped me get into college. And then in college, I was a... Uh, you know, I guess I guess you can call me a little bit of a rebel in college, and that's why I got yeah I got started in media. I've done radio, TV, a uh, little bit of film, um, internet media. Uh, I work in the video game industry, so but all that really kind of started off in college, where you know I, we had a crew of folks, and we ended up uh, basically taking over the radio station. Like they did back in the 1960s, we took it over live on air and basically created our own black programming, um, which included our flagship show, which was called A Race for the Times, where we talked about race every week for about five, six years, starting in 1992. Yeah, that was my foundation. And then I just started doing, you know, uh, TV production, uh, some film, video production, and expounded in the internet after that. We were blessed to be kind of on the ground floor of the internet, really. Being that we were in San Jose, went to San Jose State, we got onto the radio station there at the school, KSJS. And we were lucky that since we were in Silicon Valley, you know, we were exposed to brand new technology. And there was this one software called CUC Me. And they basically gave us a, a tryout at the radio station. And this software basically was, you connect video cameras, which at the time were VHS cameras, and you can stream live video and audio on the internet. This is back in 95, I believe it was. The first uh, uh, live streaming then. Yep. It was the very first live streaming. And we at the time didn't, you know, we're just college kids doing everything. Yeah, let's do this, do that. So we didn't really, you know, get to understanding what, what was happening. But we were basically the, the number one talk show on the, the station because we aired every week, every Wednesday, like nonstop, rain, sleet, snow, whatever. You know, we, were, we were there. Um, 
So when this software came on, we were the one show that was always streaming live on the internet. People from all over the world, you know, that little video box was like a video chat room. And so, you know, as we got older, after we left college, we kind of realized it's like, we don't know exactly if we were the first, but we were one of the first, especially black, streaming internet shows on, on you know, on the internet. Did any of you capitalize on that? Oh, no. Heck no. <laughs> you had no idea what you were doing. Every, everything we've ever done has been independent. Unfortunately, I mean, fortunately and unfortunately, you know, um, our drivers never necessarily have been money, even though we like, you know, like money for doing all the stuff we've been doing for the years. But that's just how it kind of, you know, turned out. Well, you know, it's kind of the story of a lot of people in Silicon Valley, because uh, it was so open source here. It built a, a piece of software and bring it to on a little disc, you know, a little floppy disc, and everybody would downloaded and we all had it and you know we say hey you gotta try this new word thing and boom we'd all get it and no one made any money on it but we were all using it and <laughs> yeah i mean right after we left college we tried to continue it on and this is you know by this time the internet was somewhat going <clears throat> and we created a website back then and in hindsight we realized we were the, one of the first black websites also, <laughs> and, you know, this was back before they had any rules on the Internet. So we had a streaming radio station back then on the Internet. It was, we were called downtheground.com, spelled D-A-U-N-D-A, ground. It was based on, yeah, it was based on our, our radio format from San Jose State, you know, based on the Underground Railroad. And we just put, you know, news as pertaining to black people at the same time. We were doing this. I was working at KPI, KPIX Radio in the city, and I had access to the news wires. And I sat at desk all day running radio shows and at the news wires. And so I would download and print out news that had to do with black people and republish it on our website. No kidding. <laughs> you cleared this thing anyway. Right. Nobody else is talking no, about it. No. So, you know, we were just doing whatever we wanted on the internet back then. Do you know how many followers you had? Or what, there was any way to, to calculate? Well, we had like a, we had like a guest book. Um, like every, every site had a guest book back then. And just, and remember it was just thing you'd say, Hey, how you doing? I like your website, blah, blah, blah. And we had people all over the world posting on this, this guest book. Just couldn't get any sponsors. Couldn't get any money coming in. No, we, well, we didn't really know how, or, you know, we were just, kind of doing it um this is before all the regulations started coming in and getting in trouble for streaming on the internet so we were just kind of you know doing it and we always wonder what would have happened if i mean we're still doing media work to this day but if we had kept with that that first website <laughs> you know yeah they would have had to grandfather you in right i mean they couldn't then if you could have got some money behind you we might have been talking to Wes Hendricks, local billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> so your first job then was at KPIX, or did you was it? Would you consider that radio station your first job? Yeah, that's pretty much my first job uh, after college. Um, I did radio a couple places. Uh, I worked in TV at KNTV and their their news uh, morning news for a couple couple years. Until they got sold, you know, media is one of those industries where every couple of years the stations get bought and sold. Well, not as much anymore because a couple of the major corporations own all the stations now. <laughs> well, back then they were like, well, we're tired of the station. Like every three years, then sell it to somebody else, and people lose their jobs. I'm going to Hawaii. Here, you can have the station. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow I, I found myself at a. Uh, Yahoo for a while. They had a streaming uh, stock. They have, still have it to this day, actually. A streaming stock show. So that's when they first started it. Um, so I was there for a little while. So. Were you announcing or were you doing the, the back background stuff? Background stuff. I was doing like audio and stuff like that for the show. I, cause I remember KPIX. Was that, is that where Dr. What's her name? Laura... Uh, 
Snyderman and Dr. Laura, all of them people were. Uh, Snyderman was the one I remember the best, where she because she had yeah. the talk show, and mm-hmm. she would all, she would she would call on you. Yeah, 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 and see, I didn't know you were working there, right? So I'm listening because I always listen to her and Jim Eason and the, and she said, "Well, what do you think, Wes?" And I thought, Wes. Yeah, yeah, that was that was just like a little bit after I, I left college. I was actually, you know, still kind of doing the radio station stuff, and but they sold that station because I was I was trying to position myself like you know everybody was asking me to be guest, you know, turn on, hey turn on the mic and say some stuff. And so I was like, yeah, I'm about to get in, get in here, and get my own show, and <laughs> they don't know that, you know. Basically. Yeah, cause she left, yes. didn't she go to yeah. another? She went national or something, right? Yeah, she did. She did. She didn't yeah. take you with her. No, no. So I know that you've been gotten in, got into filming too, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we were lucky because one of these things we didn't know we were doing, but. We got access to cameras in college. Back then, nobody had cameras, you know. And all we had to do was go to the IRC and sign a piece of paper. And like, we want to use this camera for four hours to do this. And we would get a video camera. So we started doing a couple of interviews in college. Um, and then after college, we both got our own personal video cameras and started doing interviews. And here it is. Almost 30 years later, we have about 25 years worth of footage of uh, black activists, uh, people from the civil rights movement, rappers, uh, singers, a whole bunch of stuff. So we're putting it all together in like a, a volume series inspired by Eyes on the Prize, that great black documentary that covered the civil rights movement. Well, you know, that's that's kind of my in my my little wheelhouse, uh, Black History in, in Silicon Valley. Do you have a lot of anything about Silicon Valley specifically? Most of our stuff is we've captured a lot of people who come to the Bay Area for a reason or another, even if they weren't from the Bay, you know. So we have stuff that we recorded in and around San Jose. Um, but our history is more along the lines of what happened to some of the members of the civil rights movement. Like we have, uh, Kwame Ture, who's known as Stokely Carmichael. Um, we helped bring him to San Jose state when we were students. And so we have him speaking at San Jose state. In fact, my, my partner, uh, Kwaku, who I worked with since back then, actually texted me an hour ago saying that I found it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He found the interview we did with Kwame Ture. It's the audio radio show we did. It's just the audio, or did you have the video? Just the, just the audio. But this has been missing for 20-something years. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't know where it was. But the, but we have his speaking engagement he did at San Jose State. We have that on video. Now, when he came, was there it, was it, did he just speak? Was there any debate? Did anyone, anyone question him? Yeah, yeah, they have, like, he had open questions at the end. He spoke for about an hour at open questions at the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lively discussions, huh? Yeah. And you have all yeah. of that on tape. Yep. So, so actually, you're, you're, you're working on KPIX and you're running around with this camera taking folks. Who are some other people or events that you can recall that you were involved in? Well, because we, we came through radio and a lot of us, well, we all loved music. We dabbled with interviewing entertainers as well. So we have interviews with like the last poets, uh, public enemy, the watch prophets. We have a, a quick interview with the Mary Baraka, uh, boots, Riley, you know, a lot of different entertainers. Uh, and then, you know, we have some speaking engagement like Kwame Trey. We have, uh, Khalil Muhammad. There's uh, a brother named Mikasa Ricks. Many people don't know about him. You're anxious to, help share his story. He organized with Dr. King and organized with Kwame Ture. Um, <clears throat> he was there. Like a lot of pictures you see of the marching, he's, he's standing right there. He's right there next to him. And when um, Kwame Ture, there's a video of it on Eyes of the Prize and on YouTube, when Kwame Ture first uttered the phrase, uh, black power, what we need is black power. 
You know, it was uh, William Acosta Rich who told him to say that. Who told him to say that? Willie Mikasa Ricks. Now, who's he? So he's he's just the organizer that that grew up and and worked with King and marched with King and then went on to work with Kwame Ture after that era. And um, so we have a sit down interview with him. And he, you know, he talks about Dr. King and talks about Kwame Ture, formerly Stokely Carmichael. He talked because he was a member of SNCC. So he came up with the phrase "Black Power." Did he ever give you the philosophy behind the stick, behind the phrase, did, what he was thinking? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's well, which is interesting because that's kind of like the impetus of our first volume of our documentary. Because um, we kind of want to answer some questions that have been out there since civil rights. Like, um, I know there was an article even last year talking about what Black Power is, and it's not really what the folks who came up with is black power is more, um, uh, being self-sufficient and, uh, creating institutions in our own community, being able to control our destiny and our images and, uh, our culture, basically all of our things have been taken away from us. Yeah. And much more organic than, than they, than it's been given. I mean, as yes. it's projected, uh, uh, most of the time, uh, when when folks heard black power, they thought that meant to take the power away from someone else. You know, mm-hmm. it's going to take someone else's power, and that's not what they were talking about at all. No, no. That I was I wasn't in the movement, but I was at uh, trying to get black power at the time. And, yeah. And I know what my objective was, and it was really to be able to pay my rent with my own money, and yeah. not have to depend on uh, whether someone liked my hairdo or the way I wore my clothes, you know, so Mm -hmm. to me, uh, black power meant uh, self-sufficiency. Yes. And and rather than, uh, we didn't want to copy anyone else, we just wanted to be ourselves. Yeah, for control of our own destiny. You talked about working in gaming. When did you get into gaming? Maybe about 20 years ago. uh, I worked for a startup company uh, on the peninsula. Um, it was like a early satellite content company and right across the street was electronic arts, which is uh, EA, which is pretty much the biggest video game maker, you know, from Madden to NBA live and some of the star Wars games. And, uh, I just found myself going to apply over there. And next thing I know, I started working in gaming and I've been in gaming for about 20 years, worked at different companies, uh, some mobile companies, console companies, uh, Facebook, internet companies. I'm current at uh, Sledgehammer Games, which is a subdivision company of Activision. So I'm going to make uh, Call of Duty games and stuff like that. I was just watching a thing about Africa, um, and they are really into gaming in, that, in um, South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, yeah. big time. Uh, and the company there, I can't remember the name of it, Scorpion or... I can't remember. Anyway, they were just talking about the money these kids are making in Africa. So, you know, here you can buy a week's worth of groceries there for 30 bucks, and some of these kids are winning $22,000, you know, a game. I mean, game development has come a long way. You can, you can now create a game at your house. All you need is a computer. And so you're seeing a lot of small companies and small people and Africa has taken, taken it on. Like we're going to create our own games, you know, themed around Africans and themed around Africa, African culture. And, um, there's a couple of websites out there that you could just, once you create your game, you can just publish it and put it on this website. And a lot of people, you know, go, go and pay for it and download it and play it and, so even to this, you know, my son even sends me like, you see this game, you know, he sends me articles about some Africans working on a game. Or... So there's a lot of independent black uh, developers out there, which which is a great thing since we're still upper, up, underrepresented in uh, video games. So so you started in games about 30 years ago. You've seen the evolution happen then, how it's evolved over oh, time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember I have. In fact, the I was still in boxes. I still have my first Atari game system, like the kind we used to play over your house. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a little pong game. So I've, you know, I've seen it go from that to PlayStation console systems, Xbox, uh, games on your cell phone now, games on your watch, Apple Watch, and you know, games on the internet, uh, 3D games. Now we got uh, virtual reality games. You can put a, the headset on and 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 be totally immersed in the game. So I've i pretty much seen the whole evolution of it. Just, so what part do you play in the gaming company that you companies that you work for? What what kind of position do you hold? Uh, I always work. I've been working in quality assurance, which is basically the ones who make sure everything works like it's supposed to work, um, that it makes sense, that it runs smoothly. So we check out the game every day. Just you know, there's updates to the game when they add new content. Um, <clears throat> when something breaks on the game, or we figure out a way how to break something on the game, it really has to do with a lot of uh, database work and, and tracking and hours of checking content. But uh, yeah, it's the it's the behind the scenes work. And do do, do you? try to break a game to, because it, it, be, it shouldn't, I mean, if it leaves there and it can be broken, then you didn't do your job. Yeah, that's that's yeah. basically our job is, is to break the game or find out a way you can, it can be broken. So when it leaves or it's launched, it, it has the least amount of bugs or defects as possible. So, you know, because especially now with internet and, and Twitter and you go to social media and people will immediately tell you how bad a game is or how buggy a game is and that were lower sales immediately. The social media has so. been a, a a boom to to a people, and it's a bust for people because it is so wide open. And it's just like oh yes, yeah. What can't you find out? In oral, different oral. They're using it in training too. Yes, yeah. Firefighters, airplane, airline. Guys. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Military, police. Yeah. So tell me about your family roots in Texas. Do you know much about Texas? I know a little bit about Texas. A little bit about my family in Texas. You know, I know more about uh, my fam- family out here. So the, both your grandparents were educators, yes. right? Yep. Growing up, I used to go to Texas every three years for a while, just spend some of the summer out there. And my grandfather, who I never met, uh, had his own school, which is actually not far from Texas to A&M. And uh, we have some pictures of it somewhere. But um, part of it is still standing. There's like a barn and there's a plaque there. Um, of course, there's a segregated school and he was the principal. Um, and my grandmother was a teacher who also was a musical teacher also. So we were both educators. Teach? Did she teach at that school and then eventually go into the larger school district, or did she stay in the black school district? Yeah, well, she she eventually uh, continued her, some of her work uh, privately. She had private uh, music teacher and uh, in the church after after the school. And then your mom went to a historically black college. Yep, she went to Prairie View A and M to become a nurse. And eventually, part of the Great Migration came out to California, came into L.A. And in L.A. is, is where she met my, my father, who um, has been an engineer, um, one of the first early black engineers of uh, Northern California, Alameda County, um, the district up here. So, yeah, they, they got married and came to the Bay Area. Yep. Actually, I think he... He started his engineering career in Southern California, and then your dad came up here as a civil engineer. Yeah. Yep. In Hayward. So when we drive down yep. Mission, when we drive down Mission Boulevard um, uh, in Hayward, coming into Fremont, all that work along there, we can attribute to your father. Yeah, a lot of different things. One one of his biggest claim to fame is. Uh, when you go across the Bay Bridge and there's the tunnel, there's a little there's a little dip that you have to go through on the road and go, when you go into the tunnel. And he specifically worked on some of that part that which is still there yeah, with the new bridge to make sure that the trucks didn't get 
annihilated when going through the tunnel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> See, so there was a there's a little paint where we didn't we didn't think it was, huh? The the yeah. there, he was on the team that determined how that should be designed so that there would not be an accident on that bridge. Yeah, there's so many stories yeah. like that of your parents uh, that um, you know they were just be behind the scenes doing all kinds of things, but yet uh, never getting credit, never get, never mentioning it. Yeah, it, it's it's something I learned early on in, in college is that we have to tell our own stories because, you know, um, that's how you really put down your history is, is telling our own story. So that's became one of the, one of the things that as what you're doing now is that I became a storyteller. So that's why I'm always finding myself interviewing somebody who's interesting, getting their stories out there. What, what would be the most interesting person you think you've interviewed in your, your time? during the time you've been doing this? Uh, I probably have to say uh, the man I mentioned earlier, Willie Mukasa Ricks, um, just because he was on, he was there on the cusp of the civil rights movement. You know, he, he was there for a lot of the things you see on, on the video when you pull up Martin Luther King or uh, even Stokely Carmichael. Um, and he has he has all the real stories of the civil rights movement. You know, he you know, he told us a story. Yeah, like he told us a story where he basically got set up and dropped off somewhere in the dark and he and he tells a story, we have this on video, he tells a story that it was him and a sheriff standing there in the dark. And he said the sheriff said that like, you basically you better get out of here, nigga. And pulled the gun and pulled, raised the gun and shot him. And the gun ricocheted off the tip of his skull. And he survived. And he, and he took off running and, and survived. He said it was pitch dark out there. And it gets mighty dark in the country. You know, city, <laughs> city, city, city yeah. folks don't know how dark it gets in the country. There's no street lights. Yeah. Okay? You can see the stars in the country. It, it is. You can see about the stars and the moon. <laughs> so, though, yeah, when these you, stories are amazing. So. Yeah. Uh, your generation uh, has been affected a lot by the music that has been played. What kind of music influenced you? Well, I give my love for music from my dad because uh, me, and my, you know, we, me and my sister remember growing up and them playing 8-track tapes and uh, record record player going song after song so you know from sam cook to marvin gay to um curtis mayfield rick james and stuff like that so uh a lot of those folks like me who eventually became into hip-hop that's what they grew up listening to the same kind of music so you hear that music influenced in early hip-hop so when we got to the radio station, we played a mixture of both of those things from music we grew up from our parents to early hip hop. So that's kind of what we continue to do today with uh, our radio station, Black Radio. Which do you prefer, hip hop or early music? Early. Uh... I just love really good music. Hip hop is probably my favorite because a good hip hop song can incorporate every type of black genre in one song. You know, you can hear something with some funk and some jazz and some spoken word, you know, all in one song. But I love all genres of back music. I love jazz. I love funk, blues. So, you know, I, I pretty much love it all reggae. So. Well, I can tell you, uh, and I know your father's probably related this to you. We didn't have a lot of stations in Stockton, mm -hmm. but there was a jazz station out of Salt Lake City that would come on. Friday, Saturday, and uh, I think Friday, Friday night and Saturday night, I think. Uh, but you had to stay up till midnight to get it because the radio, the local radio station signals went down, and the one, from, oh. yeah, so the one from the bandwidth would shorten so we get that band that uh, signal from Salt Lake City. So we, uh, me, Pete, Betty, Chris, Voice. <laughs> Al, we'd all sit in the dark because my mom and dad had gone to bed and they're saying, turn the lights off, you know. So we're in the dark listening to jazz from Salt Lake City, Ahmad Jamal, 
uh, what's his name, Herbie Hancock, just came um, for his first album, Made yes. Voyage, uh, the 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 Adderley Brothers, um, you know, and Nancy Wilson and Les McCain, and it, I mean, we we were in our world. And and that's how we that's uh, how we yeah. learned about jazz because there was nothing being played in San Joaquin Valley other than um, Ghost Riders in the Sky. That's interesting because when we finally, after we took over the radio station and we got on, on radio in college, our programming was on at 10 p.m. at night to two in the morning, and being kind of like the similar thing where radio stations compete, their signals compete. That on good nights when the weather was good, we were broadcasting from San Jose, we'd reach all the way to Oakland. So we had all these people calling from Oakland, listening, who would stay up late in in Oakland, you know, waiting for us to come on. Nice, nice. (laughs) So if you say you have, you like uh, hip hop, it's not, you didn't say rap, you said hip hop, right? There is a difference. So how did it, um, how does it relate to your life? And to those of your peers, how do you think hip hop relates to you? Well, uh, Chuck D had once said that that hip hop is the CNN of the ghetto of, of black people, and I think I agree with that because as much as I love other forms of genres of black music, hip hop sometimes is created really quick. You know, uh, something will happen. And someone will make a song about it that night, you know, and it will be out the very next day. <laughs> you know, a lot of, uh, with, with some that came from the Bay Area, a lot of hip hop is independent, you know, they're not on major labels. And so, um, especially in 2021, which we're in, is there's websites where you can just release your music on. So people are, you know, when they're in the mood, they just drop a song. <laughs> hey, it's, there's a new song. <laughs> so, and then... Being that it's come from spoken word, people express exactly what they what kind of want to say in, in hip hop, you know, uh, from especially the ones that are uncensored. And then they they localize it, so you can hear what's happening in some kid in Cleveland or somebody in Mozambique, you know, by listening to hip hop. I was I read Jay Z's book. Uh, about and I guess that's hip hop, right? He's more hip hop than he is rap. Yeah. And um, just the references that he makes to uh, classical writers and other musicians and all that, I just had no idea that he was so uh, um, profoundly touched by people that you would never suspect that this young man would know anything about. But after reading his book had a different appreciation of who he was and what he, and the work that he had done for it. I can't say I always understand it, uh, but uh, I do appreciate it. I do, I do appreciate it. But what would you say is the difference between hip mm-hmm. and rap? Well, uh, I was going to say that uh, you find a lot of uh, hip-hop artists are the basically the next generation from those jazz artists. I mean... If you take the example of Nas, uh, his father, Alu Dar, was a jazz musician. Um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of other stories along those lines. So a lot of the early folks who started hip-hop or some of the roles of most prominence had those direct root, roots from blues and jazz. And hip-hop is uh, more the culture and the style, direct descendant of poetry, Rap is more than say what you do, but when um like you are rapping, and uh, it was first coined on on record uh, from the Watts Prophets. Most think it was from the Last Poets, but it was from the West Coast version uh, of the Watts Prophets who grew out of the Watts Rebellion. Uh, shout out to Father Amdi, uh, he's kind of like a, a elder of mine, but um they had an album called Rapping, Rapping Black in a White World. So that's when rapping was first put down on, on, on the wax and on record. But so when people today compare rap and hip hop, rap is usually the type of music that doesn't have as much content or uh, um, not necessarily saying something. Um, and hip hop is, is more of 
pertains to the re- origination of the culture or uh, the things that came from hip hop, like, uh, you know, DJing, graffiti, um, break dancing, emceeing, and knowledge. So it's, it's, it's contextual. It's very, it has a lot of context. Whereas rap is like, in, yeah. spur of the moment, I just how I feel about my bracelet. Yeah. yeah, got it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So, future projects for Mr. Hendrix. What kinds of things are you looking at for the future? And it better be money this time. Well, <laughs> well, that's the goal. I mean, the stuff we've been doing all these years really hasn't been around or for money. <laughs> but the culmination of most of our work is is this documentary which is race for the times uh we call it the, the documental um hooker by crook we plan to drop it next month uh for black history month the first volume um um we're gonna just i think we're gonna well because of the pandemic and everything we're just gonna release it digitally we might put it on <laughs> vimeo or might just put it directly on our website um we just want to get it out there we've been working on it so long um, and then we'll start uh, putting in this, some film festivals and see what we can do with it. Hopefully, eventually get it on some digital platforms. Um, we'll see what happens with it. But um, that's the biggest thing, and it's volume one. And we already have two or three volumes set up and the footage mostly done. We just have to edit them. So, you know, we basically got together like, okay, we're, we're, we're dropping this first vlog. We're just, we're just going to drop it. This is... You know, we have so much stuff that this is just the beginning. You know, we may end up redoing the first volume and remixing it later, but we need to get this volume out there, um, especially in this climate. You know, over the past year, you've seen um, more uh, uh, actions in the street and more black people being murdered by police and, you know, injustice is still here. And this is the kind of things that we've been talking about for over the years. So, some of the people we talk to directly speak to these incidents years later. So we're like, you know, we got to, this is, you know, people, people are stuck at home watching Netflix anyway. So it's like, they should be watching what we, 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 we take. So that's, that's the, hopefully is coming this, you know, this year, 2021 race for the times. Um, you can check some of our footage on www.raceforthetimes.com. Um, we are also going to be pushing, our uh, radio station more, which is uh, B-L-A-X radio, um, dot com, and you can find us on Apple Music, uh, TuneIn, Live 365. Basically, you just type type in B-L-A-X radio on any of those apps or platforms, and you come up with our station. And it's 24 hours a day in UK, United States, and Canada. So we're just now starting to expand our programming. We're going to start adding public affairs and podcasts like yours uh, and some things like that. So, so, it, and, and the biggest thing about the station is it's all black programming and it really covers all genres of music. We have a, you know, a jazz show, uh, Saturday morning, you know, soul throwback show, Sunday morning, we got reggae and, of course, hip hop, which plays every night, and like I said, we're going to bring political affairs and talk shows. So, basically, stuff we did back in college, we're trying to redo it and and put it out there for real now. <laughs> um. Oh. Awesome. Wait a minute. Did you call your filming guerrilla filming? Is did I hear that that phrase or some kind of phrase? At at some point, I did. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Everything we we did was a uh, guerrilla. But we also called what we what we've been doing as Black Power Media. We also coined that. Tell me, when you say that, what are you actually telling me? What are you trying to tell me? Well, how did you go about doing guerrilla filming? Poor college students <laughs> didn't have jobs, so we just did whatever we could do to record stuff, from borrow cameras to checking them out from school to um, whatever. So. Here it is all these years later. We have footage from like every type of camera you can think of. VHS, digital video tape, three quarter inch tapes, which are the big old tapes that they used for TV back in the day. 
Um, in fact, we were just talking about this, that we still haven't transferred everything digitally yet. We're still going through tapes from all those years ago. So. Well, Wes, I, I want to thank you for spending time with us and sharing your what uh, the work you've done so far. And I wish you the best of luck on this film. Yeah, yeah. The best way that best way people to uh, follow us and get in contact with us, uh, we're on Facebook, uh, we're on Instagram, and we're on Twitter as Race for the Times. It's R A C E for the Times, um, and we have a website raceforthetimes.com. And then we also have Black Radio, B-L-A-X Radio dot com. So if you f- follow us on any of those uh, social media platforms or check out our website, we're going to put it everywhere we can so people will know about it when we release it. One other suggestion. Start writing about your experience. <laughs> we just had this conversation. I guess that's one of the things I didn't mention we're, we're working on this year is we, we want to write a book. Uh, based on what we went through in radio, so we're, we're, that's our next. That's our next thing. It could be a primer for a film class. Seriously, I mean that's the yeah. Kind of, yeah, yeah, truly, it really could be. Thank you, Wes, for offering us all a look at how young black technologists were allowed to experiment with untested technology, software, and hardware that were literally unknown to the general public. We will be looking forward to watching and listening to Blacks Radio. You can follow Blacks Radio at live365.com or Apple Music. Or tune in for more black content originating from Silicon Valley. And that's B-L-A-X Radio. Thank you, Wesley Hendricks, and thank you for listening.